All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us on day two of National Distance Learning Week. Um, happy to be here with um, a colleague at one of our institutions, Steve. So thank you for joining us today. If I, we haven't met, I'm Erin Maney and I manage our communications and community engagement activities at SUNY Online. And it's my pleasure to introduce Steve Sturman to you today. Stephen has over 25 years of experience as an instructional designer for the University at Buffalo School of Social Work. His focus has been on the adoption of emerging technologies for educational use and the integration of best practices for online and high flex teaching. His latest projects include the development of virtual reality, um, uh, virtual reality learning environments for teaching trauma-informed care. So welcome, Steve. Hi, thank you for having me today. Um, hi, everyone. So uh, today I'm gonna be talking about um, regular and substantive interaction. Um, obviously, this is a huge topic, so we could spend hours talking about it, um, but I've only got about 30 minutes today, leaving time for questions. So I'm going to focus specifically around um, what the regulations require from the institutional perspective. So we're going to be focusing mainly on the uh, sections that uh, talk about uh, the regular uh, interactions and um, what they require. So if you have questions, feel free to jump in with them. And um, I'll, I'm going to save a bunch of time at the end for additional questions too. So where we're going to start is we're going to take a quick look at the actual regulations and what they require. And then we'll talk a little bit about how to operationalize those. And we'll talk about this within the context of the UB School of Social Work because we just went through the process of adopting policies to meet these requirements. And we're in the process of educating our instructors on how to integrate RSI into their courses and how they can do this to meet the regulations and the standards that we've adopted. And I'll share those standards with you later on too, so that you can use them and modify them for your own departments. So if you don't know, uh, the Department of Education passed regulations in 2020 that, update, uh, that updated their requirements for regular and substantive interaction. And these went into effect in 2021. So we should all be following them now. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the actual regulations first. And then we're gonna talk about some of the additional guidance that the Department of Education put out around the regulations. Because the regulations are a little, um, they're not very specific. So there's a letter that the DOE put out called the Wiseman letter. And this was in response to the WCET um, inquiry about what specifically the regulations required and how institutions offering online programs and classes could meet the, um, the language that's put in the regulations. And one thing I want to note is we're going to focus on the regulations and the Department of Ed guidance, but in thinking about these policies and drafting these policies for your institutions, you're also going to want to check with your accrediting agencies because your agencies may have more specific requirements or um, more stringent requirements for your online courses. So you wanna make sure if you are drafting policies that you're meeting both the federal guidance and also whatever your accrediting agencies require. So if you don't know, uh, regular and substantive interaction is the regulations that differentiate between correspondence courses and online courses. Um, with the federal regulations, um, institutions of higher ed can re receive financial aid for courses that are online, but they cannot receive financial aid for courses that are just correspondence courses. And thinking back, uh, typically what a correspondence course would be, thinking back um, to the last century, um, this would be when 
a person mailed out content, the student will work on it on their own and then send some sort of um, some sort of product that demonstrated their learning and then they would just get credit for doing the work. Um, the RSI requirements are actually meant to make sure that students are interacting with faculty and instructors um, because the DOE sees this as a mark of a quality course. So really, they use these standards to differentiate between these two uh, types of learning. And it's important to note that because there are, there are big financial um, impacts if your online courses are found to be correspondence courses. If your online courses are found to be correspondence courses, then students lose financial aid for those courses. In the past, the DOE has brought, um, ha have done, um, have reviewed institutions and institutions that were found to be offering correspondence courses were asked to return financial aid that they would have received for those courses. So there are definite implications for schools if you're audited and your courses are found to be a correspondence course instead of an online course because they're not meeting these RSI requirements. Um, and I can talk more about that if people have questions, but um, what I'd like to do next is move into the specific uh, regulations. Like I said, we're going to focus on regular because regular is where the um, regulations really put um, requirements on the institution. So this is the text for the regular um, the regular uh, regulations. Um, it requires an institution to to make sure that students have interaction with their instructors prior to the student's completion of a course or competency. And really, this requires two things. Um, it requires that the instructors are actually providing substantive interaction with their students on a regular basis. So this is focused more upon the instructor making sure they're putting activities into the course to interact with their students. Um, the second paragraph of this, though, is where the institution um, really comes into play. And what it requires is that institutions have an expectation that their faculty are monitoring the students' engagements in the course and their success in the course, so whether they're doing well or not. And when the faculty are doing this monitoring, they're required to proactively reach out to their students to offer them assistance if they're not doing well, if they're not showing up in the course, and they're not engaging with the um, course materials. So those are the specific regulations. They're pretty vague, um, but luckily we have some additional guidance, as I mentioned. Um, in what the DOE put out in the uh, Wiseman letter, this is the advisory le letter explaining how they're going to check whether these regulations are being followed. They sp specifically stated that um, an institution will be able to demonstrate that they're doing this by putting policies in place. So this could be done through a combination of policies and procedures to make sure that our instructors are complying with the regulations for monitoring and outreach. So this is where the institutions really need to take action to create these policies and make sure that their faculty are following them. So another piece of guidance in the preamble um, to the regulations. The DOE states that this monitoring can happen in a bunch of different ways um, by using sophisticated systems. So we're all on Brightspace. 
So you could use the tools in Brightspace to make sure your students are going into the course, interacting with the materials, um, going through the materials and engaging in the learning process. And then you can use a bunch of different traditional ways that we assess student engagement and learning, you know, person to person evaluation. So the instructors having individual um, meetings with the students, they can do it that way, using tests or quizzes to make sure the students are learning and actively engaged in the course. And then evaluating the students um, in regular class sessions. So if you're using synchronous class sessions for online learning, you know, that regular interaction you would do, asking them questions, asking them if they understand the materials, and then following up with them if they don't. So that's how you can ensure that the monitoring requirement is being met. So let me check the chat real quick to see if there's any questions so far. Looks like we're good. Just some introduction. Great, Great thank you. Sure. Um, so what does this mean? So basically it means that institutions do need to adopt policies requiring the integration of regular and substantive interaction into your courses. Um, we need to be setting up specific expectations that faculty are monitoring the courses and reaching out to students and following up with them. And these expectations need to be uh, communi communicated to the instructors. I know oftentimes um, universities and other higher ed institutions adopt policies and they get added to the policy library and kind of forgotten about, um, but we need to be actively ensuring that faculty are aware of these and know how to interpret them. So what we've been doing at the UB School of Social Work, um, we've drafted a policy um, over the summer and put that in place. Um, I worked with uh, our Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, our MSW Director, our Online Program Director, and we drafted a policy based upon the RSI requirements specifically. And then we added in a bunch of other things specific to our school and what we thought our school wanted to have in, our, in all of our online classes to make sure that we were offering a quality experience for all of our students. Um, we recently put this out to our faculty through a faculty meeting and sent it out to all our adjuncts um, and had a short dis discussion about why we're doing this, um, what the regulations were basically, and just letting faculty know that we now have these in place. And our next steps, are to do a bunch of informational webinars. Um, I created a webinar, we've done this once already. It takes us about two hours to go through all of the RSI requirements, our additional requirements from the school and explain to faculty specifically how they can structure, how they offer the or deliver the course in a way to meet the requirements that we're asking them to hit. So that's what we're in the process of now, this educational phase, helping faculty understand why we're doing this and what they need to be doing in order to meet the federal guidelines and what we want them to do uh, while, while teaching in our school. So right now we'll take a look at the actual guidelines. Or actually, let me pause for a second and see if anyone has questions while I throw this in ch the chat. I know I'm going pretty quick, but we only got a few minutes. Let's see, no, what did I do? Okay. Did I lose my slides? <laughs> Just a second. So here's the guidelines, if you want to open those. Thanks, Steve. While we're doing that, Andrea does have a question. Mm -hmm. um, 
She's asking, how are your faculty receiving the information? And do you think they're already following these practices or do you find that they need support? Yeah. Um, so when we did this at the, um, there's the link. Um, when we did this at the faculty meeting, I was actually surprised because the feedback we got was um, that most of our faculty thought that the minimum requirements weren't enough. So I was actually surprised by that. Um, they thought we needed more stringent guidelines for our specific program. So I was happy to hear that. Um, a lot of them understood why we were doing this. And um, really what we emphasized, we've been doing online since early 2000s. I wanna say 2001, we launched our first online program. And at that point, um, you know, our idea of good pro program was um, having faculty record their lectures and we were mailing those recordings out on CDs because internet wasn't set up for streaming yet. So um, a lot of our faculty, we wanted to get them, if they were still thinking that was a best practice, to move more towards the interactive part, because we know now that that is really much better than just watching recorded lectures. So I think a lot of faculty understood that. Um, and we're happy to see us putting these in place. Um, as I mentioned, we also have done um, one of the webinars, instructional webinars, that was pretty well attended. We had about 20 faculty there for that, which is a good number for the size of our school. And um, a lot of good questions there and a lot of engagement around it. So I was happy to see that too. Um, in terms of where our faculty are, I think it's really mixed um, in terms of whether they're already complying with um, the RSI requirements. Um, in terms of actual course development, I think we're doing pretty good because we've been emphasizing the use of OSCAR um, for a long time now. I've got a bunch of Brightspace templates that faculty have been using that integrates a lot of the Oscar recommendations into it. So in terms of actually developing a course site and things like that, it's been, we're doing very well. But in terms of the delivery, it's very mixed because we do have a bunch of faculty that are still relying primarily on recorded lectures, which aren't sufficient to meet their RSI requirements. There has to be some sort of interaction. So if they're not doing that additional activity to bring in the interaction, then it doesn't meet the RSI requirements. So we have some people doing that. Um, but we also do a lot of practice courses. So a lot of our faculty are doing synchronous Zoom sessions with their online courses. And with those, there is a lot of interaction and those I feel real comfortable with. Um, and to go to Nakia's question, we do have a blend of courses. So some of them are synchronous, some of them are asynchronous. It all depends upon um, the topics of the course. Great, oh. thank you for your questions. And mm -hmm. Steve, just because there are a couple people who are not SUNY folks, I threw in a link to Oscar if people want to understand more about what that is. And that's our course quality evaluation rubric. So you could look at that. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely oh, I would definitely take a look at that if you're not familiar with it, because it does a great I great job of helping faculty think about how to improve their courses and um, especially once they've been offering it for a while. Okay. So Let's move on to our specific standards. Um, so what we've tried to do is integrate RSI, as I mentioned, and then also bring in additional requirements based upon what we think we need to be doing at, at the master's level and based upon the fact that our curriculum is very heavy practice-based. 
Um, so there needs to be a lot of interaction between the instructor and a lot of feedback between the instructor and the students who are learning how to practice with clients and um, other individuals. So we tried to integrate a bunch of different things into the um, guidelines for us. Um, so here, um, we start with the regular and substantive interaction. And really the important piece is the monitoring piece we thought. So we sp put specific guidelines out there for the monitoring. So within the first week of the class, if faculty don't see a student engaged, they're required to reach out to that student and figure out what's going on with them and why they're not engaging in the materials. So this also includes suggestions to have some sort of activity that first week, like a discussion board introduction or a small quiz, just to show that the student's engaging in the course. And then if after two weeks and multiple outreaches to the student, um, they don't get anything back from the student, then they need to reach out to our student services people and our program directors so that additional follow-up can happen. So that's really what we require within the first two weeks of classes. And then during the course of the semester, um, what we want to see is that instructors are making sure that students are in there. And if there's any two week gap that the student just disappears or stops participating, then again, they need to reach out to the student services or program director so that they can follow up with the student to make sure there's nothing going on or there's not something that they can help with to make sure that the student is being successful in the course. And as a side note, um, I think probably most people know this, but just in case you don't, um, the DOE just put out a proposed rule that they're looking at adopting that will have specific attendance tracking requirements that also look at this two week window. So depending on whether that gets adopted or not, or if it changes in some way, we may have to revisit um, the timeframes that we're talking about in this document and adjust those depending upon what the future regulations might include. So really, um, this monitoring is something new for us. We've never asked our faculty to do this in the past. Um, obviously, most of them have been engaged and do reach out if a student disappears, um, but this is a little bit stricter than what we've asked in the past. Um, and like I said, no pushback yet from faculty on having to do this. Um, so that's a good sign for us, I think. Um, and then again, we talk about interaction. And then what we also do is kind of give them some basic suggestions on what they can do. So this first week activity, have the students do something so that you know they're participating. Um, and then possibly using our midterm review to make sure that they're still engaged at that point. Um, We've put in the definitions for substantive interaction here so that faculty also understand that in addition to this regular monitoring, they also need to be doing stuff week to week or within a regular time frame based upon the length of the class um, to make sure that there is that faculty to uh, student interaction. You know, I, I think a lot of our faculty have thought that, well, if I'm just throwing up a discussion board there and the students are interacting with each other, that's enough. But we're trying to get them to understand that that's not enough based upon the regulations and the faculty actually need to participate in those discussions along with the students so that there is that faculty to student interaction. So another big piece that we wanted, I know uh, assessment and feedback is also part of the RSI requirements, um, but we felt from our school perspective, we really wanted to emphasize this with faculty too. Um, so we really added another section just emphasizing that merely grading is not enough. 
Um, you need to be providing substantive feedback to the students, so letting them know what they're doing well on, what they're not doing well on, and steps for improvement throughout the length of the course. And um, we also threw in here, um, we, we, we would really like to see faculty doing this within two weeks of the due date of the assignment. Um, sometimes we do get student complaints that they've turned papers in and haven't gotten them back in three or four weeks. So we really wanted to provide faculty with uh, a better estimate of what our expectations are. So this is... This is a new thing for faculty too, um, even though I think a lot of our faculty were striving for this to begin with. And again, more considerations for them to think about. And then, um, so those really, those two sections really focus upon the actual delivery of the course and what the instructors are doing. And then we have section three, which focuses upon their course design and their pre-planning for the course. So, you know, we require them to use Brightspace so that we don't have faculty going off and using other systems, which might make it more difficult for the students if they're not familiar with those other systems. Um, we recommend them doing week-to-week -week templates because that's how our, most of our courses are set up and some other general considerations. And really importantly, um, we want them to hit the ADA requirements for accessibility. Um, so we provide a lot of support around that too. And then, you know, the basic stuff, providing meaningful course content and activities. And again, um, some other, um, some other guidelines we'd like them to follow. follow. So if a student sends them something, we want them to respond at least within two business days. That's our expectation. Um, again, emphasizing instructors much, must monitor what the students are doing and proactively reach out to them if they disappear from the class or if they're struggling in the course. And then re-emphasizing again the detailed feedback and timely feedback um, within two weeks. So those are our basic guidelines. Feel free to look those over. Um, feel free to make modifications to them for your specific programs if you want to do that. Um, and then we also have some additional information for them. So we just define in the appendix different types of online learning because some of our faculty aren't necessarily familiar with these terms. Um, we link to the Oscar rubric and we, out, we just list all of the criteria here so that faculty are um, familiar with those. And then finally, um, what I've also done is I've created this faculty planning worksheet for our faculty. So they can sit down with the worksheet. This kind of walks them through the questions they should be asking about around regular and substantive interaction and helps to get them thinking about how do I need to modify my courses or make small changes to make sure that I'm integrating all of the standards and, you know, what should I be looking at? So, you know, how frequently should I be interacting with my students? Should I be doing that weekly, bi-weekly, monthly? And that may all be different based upon the length of the course and the breadth of the course. Um, and these are all things that we get into in the informational webinar that um, we've put together to cover this topic. Um, but this at least takes the information from that webinar and gives them a way to walk through that information after the webinar and really start thinking about this in a concrete way for their courses. Okay, I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> and I'd love to hear your questions or um, feedback. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with Andrea. That document is very helpful, Steve. I appreciate you sharing that with everyone. Um, and in particular, the, the last uh, appendix there where you get people to really reflect on their course, but you also, I noticed in parentheses, give some examples of things that they could consider, right? Yes, and I think that's helpful because sometimes we don't know 
we might understand how we want or that we want to fix something, but not necessarily know how. And I mean, that kind of goes back even to the Oscar rubric, right? You know that maybe this should be in my course, but I don't know how to do it, right? So um, I think that's really helpful. And of course, you as an ID meeting with your faculty to help them along and support them through these questions. Yeah, yeah. So really, you know, this is our attempt to get them to think about it, then hopefully encourage, give them enough encouragement to say, oh, I do need to attend this informational session so that I can see how they're recommending we make these integrations. So really, you know, we move from policy and just general knowledge, this is something you need to do, to the webinar where it's now you know we need to do this. This is how you can take practical steps to make sure that you're meeting the requirements. Um, yeah. And yeah. I do have another question sent, that was sent to me in the chat here. So um, we are joined by Nancy, who is from Florida Southwestern University. And she was asking, how do you plan to measure the results of implementing RSI uh, in course design? And what metrics or indicators might be used to ensure federal requirements have been met? Right. So that is something we're still working on in terms of tracking the monitoring and that information. Um, in terms of the course development and things like that, um, we've been tracking, we had funding to have our faculty um, participate in SUNY offered trainings around the Oscar rubric and how to integrate that into your class. So we've been tracking who's been attending that and taking advantage of that. Um, so we have a good sense that most of our faculty are at least aware of Oscar and how to use that within the course design. In terms of actual course delivery, that's something we're still working on. Um, we just put the policy in place. Um, our next steps will be to actually, I think, start thinking about a system to track how this is happening or not. Um, right now, we're basically relying upon um, the midterm and final reviews from students to see what their comments are in terms of how much they're interacting with their faculty um, but we do recognize that we do need to formalize some way to track uh, the monitoring happening and um, how to review um, whether faculty are actually integrating these activities into their courses. Great. Are there other questions, comments? <laughs> yeah, you could take the time to, to browse through all that. So Steve, can you mention again um, about discussions, how they should be led in asynchronous courses to meet R RSI? Yeah, yeah. So um, let me scroll up. So in the RSI requirements, if you're not familiar, um, under the definition of substantive, um, the DOE defines substantive as meaning, you know, the, the content of the course in question. So you need, any discussions have to be about the content in the course. So it can't be just how your day is going, that type of stuff. Um, and then it needs to include two of these other uh, factors. Uh, it could be providing direct instruction, assessment and feedback, information or questions responding about the course content, or facilitating group discussion regarding the content. So this is kind of vague. And unfortunately, the only guidance we have from the DOE on this point is that um, when they look at whether an institution or course is meeting the discussion requirement, it'll be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. So there's really no, um, no specific guidance on this in terms of the regulations and the guidance letters that have been put out so far. So this is one area 
people have been asking, how do we make this happen? So in this instance, what I've been doing with my faculty is just looking at the literature on adult learning theories, things like that, and pointing out some of the best practices based upon what we know about the discussions. You know, so that means you don't want to be responding to all the students because that can shut down the discussion. Um, but you probably want to be responding to 10 to 20 percent of the students each week. So in a 20 person course, that's two to four people you're responding to each week. Um, you want to be uh, engaging in the conversation. So either questioning posts or adding to those posts and making sure that you're actively engaged in those discussions so that there is that student to instructor um, interaction. So that's the way I've been approaching this since um, there are no specific guidelines from the Department of Ed. Um, and so far faculty seem to be open to that. Um, and I often make the point you know, if you were teaching this as a seated class, you wouldn't walk into the classroom, say to the students, this week we're discussing, um, you know, how alcohol use affects families, and then walk out of the room and leave your students there to discuss it by themselves. So I think helping faculty understand that they need to be engaged in the discussions without having any specific guidelines is probably the best way to approach that right now. Thanks for that, Steve, and for those examples. And you did touch on a couple things that I put a link in there about um, from Oscar that addresses uh, standards specifically that talk about RSI. Um, and some of them you actually touched on in, in your answer there. But if people want to go and look further, you can click on those specific standards. It does talk about what kind of feedback, what kind of engagement is substantive. Um, so that may be helpful for, as a kind of a takeaway to go look for more information after this. Other questions for Steve? Thanks for your inquiry too. It's really good to get the questions out there and think through this collaboratively. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat too. So if you do review the document and have questions later on, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm always happy to discuss this in more detail and also get other people's opinions on this and how they're um, trying to uh, meet the regulations and the guidelines. Um, I haven't seen a lot of other institutions doing this. Um, I knew I know SUNY Niagara, um, formerly NCCC, has some great um, great approaches to how they do this with their online faculty. So if you're looking for additional resources, I would recommend checking them out. Um, but if uh, your other institutions are doing this, I'd be I'd love to hear how you're tackling it too. That's a great wrap up question. Is there anyone here on the webinar that has uh, some ideas to share about how you're doing this? That's why they're here, right? <laughs> why we're I can here. offer at a previous uh, job I was at. I was surprised at how many discussion boards, the prompts in the discussion boards really could have been just like multiple choice questions in an exam. And so we encouraged uh, uh, our uh, instructors to look at your prompts and if they could be turned into a multiple choice question, there probably isn't much room for interaction. So we encouraged it, especially with topics or subjects um, that dealt with ethics or anything like that, like a, a, a health department or a nursing department, we encourage them to turn discussion questions into questions of ethics, because obviously people have different backgrounds and different perceptions. Um, uh, in some like environmental courses and that, where it might not 
be as much ethics, but maybe more regulations. We could ask them case study, you know, you know, like even invent case studies, especially in the day of Chat GPT, where you can go in and and ask the Chat to to generate a fake case study for you, where you could split hairs between regulatory type things that we have found really leads to discussions uh, and interactions going back and forth. Um, so, uh, so things like that we found made discussion boards less likely to be a, uh, how would you compute the, uh, uh, calorie usage in this diet or something, because that's such a straightforward cut and dry type of thing. And instead turning it into like, uh, you know, is this a HIPAA violation if this happened and, and why or why not? And would this if you were a supervisor, would you, um, y you know, uh, fire an employee who did this or whatever? And those tended to lead to really good discussions in the course. Yeah, yeah, that is a great approach. You know, luckily in social work, we have a lot of questions and courses that <laughs> revolve around touchy subjects. So for us, I think it's easy for faculty to focus on those types of questions. But it, that's definitely a great way to get students engaged in the course material. Thank you for sharing that, Ron. Um, I'm going to put real quick, uh, I found the link, Steve, to the um, SUNY Niagara resources for um, online teaching faculty. So that link there in the top menu, you'll see all kinds of topics that they have for resources. Andrea sharing. We're currently working with our department chairs to help create an expectations guide similar to what Steve shared, but need to revamp our online training process. Want to tie in RSI? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, that's really important. You know, um, I was at a CPD, uh, CPD uh, Birds of a Feather group, and we were talking about that too. And it, one of the interesting things we came away with was that, you know, Oscar is a great way to think about course development and um, course planning, but it doesn't really talk about the actual course delivery a lot. So the actual activities you're doing in the class, whether that's synchronous or asynchronous. So um, really the RSI standards, I think are looking at that second part the actual course delivery. So I think if you can get faculty to start thinking about it that way, um, I think it's helpful for them because they understand, especially if you've been doing the Oscar stuff for 10 years, they understand that, okay, I've got a great looking course site, but now I really need to focus on my actual delivery and the activities I'm doing with my students to make sure that those are engaging and helping the students learn. Thanks everyone. So given the time, I'm going to uh, wrap us up here real quick. Um, so again, Steve, of course, I just wanna thank you for, um, for sharing with everybody today, for being willing to participate. I think there was a lot of interest in this topic and thank you to everyone who attended for your engagement and participation. Um, the full schedule of our sessions for this week can be found at that first link and recordings and slides resources will be posted along uh, on that same page uh, by the end of the day. As soon as the video renders, I try to get them up there. I know people want them. Um, and so if you didn't know, National Distance Learning Week is sponsored by the U.S. Distance Learning Association. So they have several events across the country um, for the week as well that you can check out. They also support SUNY online webinars by um, hosting uh, them on their website as well. So um, we appreciate you and hope to see you at another event this week.